What it do, cucks? It's your boy, the hater, up in this mug. And it's time for another episode of Hater Outdoors Smackdown Review. The last episode of Smackdown on Fox. As the hater explained in the past, Fox basically decided to drop Smackdown because they weren't getting it done in the ratings. Now, at the same time, clearly, as Raw gets closer and closer to moving on to Netflix, Smackdown is being positioned as the main show. This is evidenced by the fact that Michael Cole and Corey Graves are now on SmackDown where they belong because Raw is a jobber show. This is just complete and utter mismanagement. If anything, they can just blame it on Adam Pearce who is the worst authority figure in the history of wrestling. But with that being said, let's get to today's episode which in my opinion was complete and utter garbage. As usual, Cucky Rhodes comes out in a suit, meaning he's not going to wrestle tonight, right? This is a common theme. It is what it is. We know that Cucky Rhodes just doesn't do his job, you know? And anybody that thinks this is a good title run, at this point, it's just straight up stupid, all right? It's as simple as that. I don't care what anybody says. This is a stupid title run. This is a stupid champion, and none of this stuff is entertaining. I don't know how anyone can be entertained by the same Cody Rhodes promo literally for like 15, 16, up to 20 weeks. And there is no sign of this stopping because there is no sign of any credible challenger to fight Cucky Rhodes. Speaking of non-credible challengers, Solo Sokoa, Solo Sokuk himself, comes out and says, Cody, you want me next week? You got me. Even though Cody Rhodes is basically saying, no, I don't want you. In the, in the actual promo, Cucky basically undermines him by saying he's a jobber and then eventually calls out Jobber Fatu, who gets on the apron and looks at Solo and says, I love you, Tribal Chief. I love you, like Roel Romero from the UFC. This guy is just like, this is a complete waste of time. This is going to amount to nothing. I could see him and Obafemi tag teaming in a meaningless comedy tag team in a few years. I know a lot of people expect him to be stars, but people also expected Montez Ford to be a star. More on that later. Basically, Solo Sokoa doesn't know what the hell he's saying. He has no idea what's going on. And Cody Rhodes basically says he wants to fight Jacob Fatu. Jacob Fatu says no. Solo says you're driving a wedge between us or trying to. So, like, I don't even know how that's possible because the way that Jacob Fatu is presented is like he's an idiot. Who, he would never understand what Cody Rhodes is trying to do. He's too stupid. All, he's go all he does is he comes out there, acts like a savage, and says, I love you, tribal chief. You know, maybe there's something there, but the way that Jacob Fatu has been introduced is not... Is not effective, right? If you compare his introduction straight up just to that of Solo Sokoa on NXT, it's inferior. Solo Sokoa in NXT felt like an up-and-coming star, and now some of that is paying dividends. Not that this was anything great, it was bad. Nick Aldis, unlike Adam Pearce, comes out and says, no, you're not going to do anything today because we're all going to do this next week on a USA Network, basically. Meanwhile, the Street Jobbers, aka the Street Profits, and DIJ, Do It Jobbers, also known as DIY by some, come out to back up Cucky Rhodes. They're going to have an eight-man tag against the Bloodline tonight. We already knew that, so Nick Aldis basically then says, next week, the match is going to be a cage match. So in other words, Cody Rhodes is going to completely end the push of um, Solo Sokoa. I will say this is an interesting match because, you know, in my opinion, it's better for Solo Sokoa to just become the champion. You know, I said this last time. It's probably not going to happen, obviously, but, you know, I will say this, there is a very, very small, like less than 1% chance that this could happen for two reasons and two reasons only. Number one, Cody Rhodes' title reign has been a complete and utter disaster, right? He is not a champion that draws, nobody cares about him at all, and he is stale as hell. He is boring. The fact that people haven't booed him yet is a surprise to me, but it's around the corner. Meanwhile, Solo Sekuk being champion sets him up for the next return of Roman Reigns, which hopefully will be handled better than the previous one. More likely than not, Cucky's gonna win because Roman Reigns is gonna interfere. Um, the reason why something's gonna happen in this match, probably another Roman Reigns return, I don't know, is because it's the first episode on a new network, so they really want people to start talking about it, right? I don't think that it would be a good look to have Solo Sekuk become the champion because then everyone's gonna turn the TV off. 
So probably Cody's going to win like 99.9999%, but there's going to be something. Maybe Roman, maybe Paul Heyman, someone's going to do something and interfere. Uh, or otherwise, Cody Rhodes is going to overcome the odds John Cena style. Who cares? Nobody uh, is going to look forward to this, other than the fact that there's some unknowns because it's a new network. If this was like on uh, the next episode of SmackDown and it wasn't a special episode, nobody would care at all. Next up, we have a boring-ass uh, segment with Tiffany Stratton, who looks horrible. I don't know what this girl does to herself. She's a young girl. She's got these fake plastic tits just bulging out of her bra in the most unattractive way ever. She looks like, like drag queens that wear those fake boobs. She looks like that. She's got this weird bloated up face like Randy Orton, right? And her lips are just like 10 times the size they should be. She just looks atrocious. And it's unfortunate because I think she's an attractive girl otherwise, you know? If she didn't do any of these things, I think she would be much more attractive uh, looking. She's there with Pretty Deadly, who are now basically a bunch of Ricos, right? They have a Rico gimmick. They're just there, like, being goofs. But whatever, right? Basically, um, Nia Jax comes out and says, you know, people said you're going to betray me. Uh, ha, 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 he, he, he. Tiffany says, no, my queen, I won't. So Tiffany Stratton has taken an inferior, subordinate, submissive role to Nia Jax. We all know how this ends with Tiffany Stratton cashing in whether it's against Nia Jax or not, is immaterial because basically the fact that Tiffany Stratton is there with the title, I mean with the money in the bank, indicates that she's going to probably win the title. So who cares who's the champion now? Nevertheless, we have a match. It's Bailey versus Tiffany Stratton. The match happens. I skipped most of it. I was bored out of my mind. At the end, Nia Jax comes out, uh, causes an inadvertent distraction where Tiffany Stratton has Bailey pinned. And the, the implications were that if it weren't for this distraction, Tiffany Stratton would have won the match. But I'm not compelled by that for one reason and one reason only. And that is that why would anyone kick out of anything unless the referee is counting? You know, like if it's like a chair shot to the head and the person's out and they're getting pinned, that makes sense, right? Because it's like the, the underlying premise is they can't kick out because they, they're so hurt. But in this case, it was a backslide. So Bailey should just wait there until she hears two, you know, one to then kick out, which is exactly what she does. The, the, the distraction uh, further causes Tiffany Stratton to get, to get distracted more, and Bailey hits the rose plant and wins. This was really dumb. Uh, at some point, I think it was before this or after this, I don't remember, uh, Kevin Owens has a segment backstage with um, uh, Theory and Grayson Waller. By the way, um, sometimes things just hit me a little bit late, but the name Austin Theory is one of the dumbest names of all time. What the hell does that even mean? Austin Theory. What's the theory? Anyway, the theory, my theory, is that he's a, he's a massive jobber. Anyways, Kevin Owens basically says, me and Cody are fine, but you guys aren't friends anymore. Triple threat. Uh, Kevin Owens just books the triple threat, and they're going to have it later tonight. Nobody cares at all. Obviously, Kevin Owens is going to beat these two lower-level undercard jobbers. But it's very embarrassing because at the end of the day, these guys are the tag team champions and they should be destroying uh, Kevin Owens during the match and then they can fight each other or something to further, uh, you know, sell the rift that exists between them. But nobody thinks about these things that far. Then we have a backstage vignette with Legado del Fantasma, which is one of the worst vignettes I've ever seen in my life. The, the lack of charisma in this group of four people is unprecedented. I think it's safe to say that Retribution had more charisma than these guys. It's basically Umberto Carrillo and Angel Garza, who we were told remind us of Eddie Guerrero, uh, just being like weird. They're like, ah, we're gonna win, da, 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 da. They're just like saying nonsense. And Santos Escobar, who also has zero charisma, and Electra Lopez, who I don't even know how she has a job, right? They're basically saying that they won a match. Finally, these two dipshits won a match. And Santos is like, was it for a title? What do you mean, was it for a title? You know damn well these guys are never going to get a title shot. They're two jobbers, right? But Santos is almost like talking down to them in the beginning, as if you'd think that Santos is like Brock Lesnar. Santos has never won a match. Like, I don't think he's ever won a SmackDown match. All this guy does is lose. He just loses everything. So does Humberto Carrillo and, and uh, Angel Garza. These guys are complete losers. Electro Lopez has never wrestled, as far as I know. These people just, all they do is lose. Like, there, there has never been a group of bigger jobbers in the history of wrestling, in, this, in the traditional sense, that these guys are just there to lose to other people. 
they are the, the three worst wrestlers in history. Now, they've got some skill in the ring, but nobody cares about that if all they do is lose. But despite the fact that all they've done their entire careers is lose and lose and lose and lose and embarrass themselves and accomplish absolutely nothing, despite being around for like five, six years at this point, they declare themselves winners. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. Santos basically says, victory is ours. Based on what? You haven't won one match. You don't know what victory is. Like, if there's anybody in the roster that has no idea what victory is, it's Santos Escobar because he's never won a match. Right? And they're basically saying, now we're going to start winning. Electro Lopez says, now is our time. Based on what? Based on the fact that Umberto and uh, fucking um, Angel Garza beat the jobber tag team of Baron Corbin and Apollo Crews, which is literally a jobber tag team. They're a thrown together tag team of two guys that haven't won a singles match in like 10 years. There was a story in NXT about how bad Baron Corbin is. Like, his gimmick, Baron Corbin is such a jobber that his gimmick is. He never wins. Like, that's his gimmick. His gimmick is, wow, he's been around for like 10, 13 years, and he's done fucking nothing in the last seven. That's literally what the storyline was. And basically, uh, Braun Breaker, who is a winner, is pulling this guy out of the misery of being someone that's never won anything meaningful in seven years. This is the storyline. And this guy now is, a, is like a happy-go-lucky friend of Apollo Cruz's. They beat this guy, and they're like, we're champions now. Shut up, you're undercard jobbers. You're not even worthy of being on TV. Um, then we have uh, a little mini vignette, and we see Giovanni Vinci walking down. He looks horrible. He just looks like a European douche. That's obviously the gimmick that they're going for. It's basically a Ludwig Kaiser gimmick, right? And this guy apparently has forgotten that Ludwig Kaiser and uh, Gunther turned their back on him. Now he's just a smiling idiot, right? This is obviously a jobber gimmick. Um, if it ends up with anything, um, it, it's, like, it's going to be immaterial. Even if this guy starts a winning streak, he's going to end up being a jobber. This is a complete waste of time. This guy should be fired. You know, he would be... He's one of the few wrestlers who would benefit from going to AEW because all he can do is wrestle. He has no personality, no charisma. He's bald, right? They're giving him this Italian gimmick, but it's really stupid, right? I don't know why this person has even been re repackaged and reintroduced. He comes out, as he's taking off his clothes, the referee, for some reason, rings the bell, which is not customary, right? Because the referee rings the bell when the people are ready. Now, like, he's still making his entrance, basically. Referee decides to ring the bell. Apollo Crews, who is his opponent, rolls him up with a crucifix and pins him. Giovanni Vinci is pissed off, but you know that this is a meaningless gimmick because they cut away immediately, right? They cut away immediately. Nobody cares at all about this. This is a complete waste of everybody's time. Luckily, it was a short segment, so nobody cared. No one's going to remember it. No one's going to talk about it. Paulo Cruz is celebrating, being like, nice debut, like, as if he's, like, some winner, too. Anyways, then we go to the back with another horrible 0 out of 10 segment. We have Chelsea Green, who, in my opinion, is played out. Like, it's over. You know? It's never going to happen. You need to strike when the iron is hot. She was over, like, five months ago. Now she's with Dewdrop, and nobody cares. Basically, she's just saying nonsense to Nick Aldis. It's just, it's very strange. Again, they're just, they're talking to him. Being like, oh, this and that. Meechin comes up, another massive jobber. And she and um, Chelsea Green have like a back and forth. Meechin throws in some ghetto jabs, basically, right? She's like, yeah, you gonna talk to me like that before I beat that pancake? Like, it's like, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Enough of this, man. Enough. Of what is Meechin? First she's with like fucking AJ Styles. Now she's just like a random person named Meechin. It's a complete waste of time. Nick Aldis then says, you know, I like analogies too. And then he proceeds to quote a metaphor about getting back on the horse. So in kayfabe at least, right? Obviously they have shit writers, right? These people never took a writing class in their lives. They, in, in 11th grade English, like in AP English, motherfucks, the hater learned what a metaphor, well, I already knew, but we... Taught, it was taught to us formally what a metaphor was and what an analogy was. And what Nick Aldis said was a metaphor, but because he's a fucking idiot, he thinks it's, he thinks it's an analogy. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's not that big of a deal, but it is because Nick Aldis is presented as an intellectual, right? The WWE audience doesn't know that Nick Aldis was a wrestler. He's presented as a suit. By the way, he was looking like rock star spud. Basically, he's presented as a guy that knows what he's doing, an executive. But he doesn't even know what a fucking metaphor is, right? Which makes him look like a complete moron. It's like, why are you wearing a suit? You don't even know what a metaphor is, and you're out there talking like you're smart. You're fucking dumb. You know what I mean? And in my opinion, either the writers don't know what a metaphor is, or Nick Aldis went off the cuff, and he doesn't know what a metaphor is, and I'm not sure which one's worse. 
It just shows how stupid wrestling is and it really shows how stupid wrestling fans are because probably most people didn't pick up on this because let's be real the average wrestling fan is probably a d minus student let's be real these people like there's the amount of intellectual people people that are smart and have any kind of you know uh intellectual capability like maybe an advanced degree or work in some sort of field like that or work in education is basically zero it's a bunch of morons who they don't know what a fucking metaphor is so they're like that that sounds smart like just complete like idiots like people that you can just like push and they're like i don't know where i am you know like dumb fucks completely right um but anyways the whole thing was really stupid and also it advanced absolutely nothing uh then we have uh kevin owens in the triple threat against those two jobbers owens wins with a stunner they beat him up afterwards a complete and utter waste of everyone's time nobody cares that owens can beat the tag team champions and nobody cares if the tag team champions get along or don't get along because they're both massive jobbers when eddie guerrero and Rey mysterio had the do they get along and then they do get along but then guerrero betrays mysterio and creates one of the greatest storylines ever that stuff that stuff was good because it was predicated upon the fact that Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero like Eddie Guerrero was already a former champion and Rey Mysterio was getting a massive push before that anyways and then he got one after Eddie Guerrero died right so it's like these are like two legends already right they're already legends so like it matters to, to you know the, the, the viewer wants to know who the superior one is right but with respect to, to something like eight town down under nobody cares if if theory who has one of the dumbest names of all time is superior to grayson waller because even if he is it means absolutely nothing right i think i missed a segment i just i just remembered this was actually one of the good segments la knight comes out and does his thing he's trying to get the catchphrase hit it and quit it over it's not a good catchphrase he already has enough catchphrases I don't agree with this but it is what it is right then Carmelo Hayes comes out and you can just tell that Carmelo Hayes is just not on the level of LA Knight right like he has a similar gimmick in that his gimmick is basically I'm a cool guy I'm him right I can get it done and I'm like awesome right but you see him next to LA Knight and it's like what the fuck is this jobber doing here LA Knight would beat his ass in real life and he should have just beaten his ass right there which is exactly what happens but first we have to endure Andrade on the mic Andrade comes out doesn't know what the fuck he's saying probably says a bunch of bullshit basically he says Carmelo beat me for two weeks in a row but like nobody cares I should be the number one contender you've lost two matches in a row and you should be the number one contender Carmelo on the other hand says I beat you and I should be the number one contender LA Knight basically buries both of them and says nobody cares about either of you you're both massive jobbers right Andrade pushes him then Carmelo and Andrade scrap basically LA Knight hits the BFT on Andrade then pretends to leave the ring or he's about to leave the ring Carmelo's talking shit to Andrade he hits Andrade with the BFT this is going absolutely nowhere LA Knight should squash both of these complete nobodies who then should form a tag team and start wrestling Legado del Fantasma because they should be on the undercard if we still had Sunday Night Heat uh, Carmelo Hayes would never be on Smackdown or Raw Carmelo Hayes is a complete failure at this point right a lot of people thought this guy was going to be a huge and massive success he obviously isn't once again one point for the hater motherfucks I said it the whole time you're like Carmelo Hayes is going to be a massive star I, and I think I said he's going to be trading wins and losses with Humberto Carrillo right and look what's happening he's trading wins and losses with Andrade who might as well be Humberto Carrillo because there's nothing to differentiate the two of them since they all all they do is to lose every match a complete and utter waste of time the only thing that happened here was LA Knight basically um put himself over as being far superior to these two nobodies now that's pretty cool generally but it's like we already knew that right everybody knows LA Knight is better than these guys LA Knight feels like a star and that's a rare thing in today's wrestling so the fact that LA Knight is being held down by the chains that is the United States title is unacceptable LA Knight should be a credible challenger to Cucky Rhodes likewise Austin Theory when he was beating John Cena if they had pushed him correctly he would now be in a situation where he would be a credible threat to Cucky Rhodes right however none of them are right none of them are motherfucks so that's what happens with all that bull right um then we have a match between Chelsea and Michin Chelsea wins nobody cares at all the implications of this match are absolutely zero they could have this match for the next 10 weeks and nobody would give a flying fuck this is basically the female equivalent of Carmelo Hayes and Andrade nobody cares they could have a good match all they want but nobody's watching nobody gives a shit 
probably at this point, everyone that was watching went and took a massive dump. You know what I'm saying? Um, but probably nobody was watching because we had an awesome ass football game tonight. Then we have the main event. All I got to say about the main event is everybody knew that the four man jobber team of DIJ and the street jobbers have absolutely zero chance of winning. This would be the equivalent of taking a mid level stable. Like if you took like right to censor and you had them wrestle against, I don't know, like Headbanger Thrasher, Headbanger Mosh, SA Rios, and like Dean Malenko. It would be like that, right? It would be like, of course, the Dean Malenko team has no chance because they're never on TV. Like, DIY is never on TV. Street Profits are like, they're one step away from being fired, if you ask me. Right? If it weren't for Bianca Belair, I don't think Montez Ford would have a job anymore. This is a colossal failure on all fronts. And all I could think during this match was remembering how everybody thought that Montez Ford was going to be this massive star. And once again, one more point for the hater, I called it perfectly. I said, these guys are absolute jobbers. Uh, like, Montez Ford is never going to be a star. At this point, they're on the same level as the Good Brothers. They're not even a worthwhile tag team, right? Like, they're on the level of, like, pretty deadly, right? Rightfully so. I will say this. Montez Ford, you can tell that this motherfucker at least tries, right? He looks good. He's a good-looking guy. He's always in shape. He's bigger than I thought. And when you put him next to Jacob Fatu, it's like, it, 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 it's almost baffling, right? It's almost baffling. How Jacob Fatu is getting more of a push. In my opinion, like Jacob Fatu would get his ass beat by Montez Ford. He would definitely get his ass beat by Austin Theory, right? But because he's Samoan, they get this boost and like toughness, right? Oh, the Samoans, they're tough. Sure they are. Name three Samoan combat athletes. Exactly, you can't. Name three prominent Samoans in any sport other than football. And even there, they're not like the best at, at, at anything. But anyways, but I understand the Samoans are a warrior culture, and I do have a lot of respect for the Samoans and the Polynesians. But I have a lot of respect for the Samoans and Polynesians that look like The Rock and Roman Reigns. Not the ones that let themselves go, these flabby fucks like Solo Sokoa and Camacho and Jacob Fatu. Jacob Fatu is never going to be a star. This guy has Obafemi written all over it. And you know what? Like a lot of people say Obafemi is going to be a star. Have I, honestly, name one time I was wrong. Name one time that the hater said this guy's not gonna be a star and the person became a star. It's literally never happened, right? I've always been right. So, Karrion Cross, uh, fucking Montez Ford, um, Umberto Carrillo, Andrade in his return, Carmelo Hayes, Trick Williams is gonna be on his way out sooner rather than later. All these guys are never gonna make it. You know, and the, and, and the, 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 the cold hard truth is that none of them are good enough. Even Montez Ford, who stands head and shoulders above all of these jobbers, right? Even he is just not good enough, right? He's not charismatic enough. He's not big enough. He's none of these things enough, right? Like if you were, if you were to compare, like if we're being honest, if you were to compare like Montez Ford versus uh, Austin Theory, right? In terms of like, you know, their, their aesthetic appeal, they're both good looking guys, but Austin Theory is like, has like 30, 40 pounds of muscle on him. Like Austin Theory is just like one of the best physiques in the business. He's better in the ring, right? Uh, Montez Ford is funnier, but I think that Austin Theory is actually better on promos. He just doesn't get a chance, right? And beyond that, like Austin Theory, at least until recently, was presented as a serious wrestler. Montez Ford has been presented as a goof the entire time. And as a result of that, he can never be a main eventer. Now, this is also evidenced by the fact that this boring ass match basically ends with a superplex on the outside. Then Montez Ford tags in, and as soon as he tags in, I'm like, here it is, he's tagging in to take the pin, which is exactly what happened. He tags in, hits a 450, very impressive. Jacob had two, th this, you can't make this shit up. This, this was almost booked like by the lover, you know what I'm saying? Jacob had two runs in, and he starts beating everybody up by doing the Samoan moveset. For some reason, when Jacob Fatu does a Samoan moveset, it's, it's more effective than when Angelo Dawkins, who is bigger and stronger than him, and a real athlete, does it, right? Angelo Dawkins does a super kick, no sell. Fat ass Jacob Fatu does it, massive sell, everyone's just getting destroyed. He hits an impaler DDT, Corey Graves tries to put it over as if it's like the best DDT ever. It's not. It's not even better than Gangrel's, right? There's two people that do the impaler, Gangrel and Jacob Fatu. Gangrel does it better. So it, by that logic, it's the worst Impaler DDT of all time, right? It's not better than Bobby Roode's glorious DDT. It's not better than anything because he's not good, right? After this, he tags in Solo. Solo picks up uh, Montez Ford, hits a Samoan spike, 
pulls his head up as he's prone on the ground and hits him with another similar spike and pins him like the jobber that he is. And that's it, motherfucks. You may as well just fire uh, Dawkins, Montez Ford, and BFAB. And while you're at it, take Gargano and Champa with you because these guys are never going to amount to anything. And that's the story of, of this week's SmackDown. Everyone that wrestled today was a jobber. There was not one person that wrestled that is even remotely worth it, right? If this were the Attitude Era, literally none of the people that wrestled today would make it. Zero percent of them would make it. Not one percent, zero percent would make it. And if you throw in the people that were in the fucking, in the promos and the vignettes, you got LA Knight, he would make it. Cucky Rhodes, I think Cucky Rhodes has the capacity and always has had the capacity to be a decent mid-carder, but he sure as shit would never be the champion. So there you have it. The rest of them, Jacob Fatu, Solo Sokoa, these guys would never, they, they might be like, they might be like on the level of Rosie and Jamal, meaning that they're going to be a jobber tag team. The other two, Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa, these guys have absolutely no business being in WWE. These guys need to go back to New Japan and wrestle nobodies, you know, at like 4 a.m. American time. Nobody cares about this. They're completely overshadowed by Jacob Fatu and Solo Sokoa. They're literally just two other guys. You could replace them with anybody. You could take Idris Sanofe and, and Malik Blade and put them with the bloodline and nobody would care, nobody would notice, and nobody would complain. It's as simple as that, cucks. They add nothing to this. They've added nothing to anything they've ever done. And in my opinion, this episode of SmackDown was a complete and utter zero out of ten disaster of epic por epic proportions that nobody can justify. If you were entertained by this, then I don't know what to tell you. Then I suggest you go watch Hello Kitty because that will probably entertain you as well. Anything and everything would entertain you if this crap entertained you, right? The amount of inconsistencies. You have Montez Ford, who, who is like bigger than Jacob Fatu, but is presented as this cruiserweight type, right? You have Angelo Dawkins, who is much bigger and much more legit, and he does a super kick, but, be, but just, just because, there's no, literally no other reason. Just because Jacob Fatu is Samoan, he's, his super kick and his Samoan moveset is better. As a matter of fact, Jacob Fatu gets an extra added bonus because his Samoan moveset, for some strange reason, is more impressive and it does more damage, I don't know why, it does more damage than Jimmy Uso's or Umaga's or anybody's. This, the, 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 kind of, the kind of weird squashy pushes that Jacob Fatu is, uh, is getting are going to lead to nothing. It's a complete waste of time. And they're also not believable because he doesn't do anything interesting. He did the impaler. He did it wrong. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like he spiked the guy on his head. It looked, it looked devastating, but it wasn't an impaler DDT. It was goofy, right? And then, you know, he completely buried Montez Ford uh, even further. And if there's anybody that cannot afford to be buried any further, it's Montez Ford, cucks. But this is not about Montez Ford. It's not even about Jacob Fatu. I hope that these people find the rhythm. This is about the complete lack of direction on SmackDown, right? It is a complete disaster. With that being said, cucks, this has been your SmackDown review. Zero out of ten up in this bitch.